Welcome to our second course in the Scrum training series. In this class, we're going to talk about Agile, the methodology, a background of it to help understand um, the key principles behind it. Uh, as a course goal, I've written down as a PSI associate, I want to learn about the origin of Agile and Lean methodologies so that I can understand the importance of their core principles. And a few basic acceptance criteria for this course. I hope you t that you can gain out of this is to be able to understand the waterfall methodology and how it started, which is odd in an agile course, but it's crucial to be able to understand agile itself. Uh, to be able to main to name the main facets of lean manufacturing, understanding the principles of the agile manifesto, and to know the key differences between waterfall and the agile methodologies. So here's our just our basic game plan for today. We're going to go over traditional manufacturing. It kind of seems like an odd place to start, but you'll understand. Uh, and how that flows into traditional waterfall methodology. And then going into lean manufacturing. And how that flows into agile software development methodologies. And then we're going to finish off with some basic information on Scrum. So, just dive right into it with, with manufacturing. So, manufacturing today really started back in the 18th and 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that was a worldwide revolution that, that introduced amazing new ways of producing products. Uh, some very key events throughout this revolution, one of them was interchangeable parts with Eli Whitney. In 1800, he standardized gun assembly with interchangeable parts taking it away from a more of an art form to mass production possible. And then fast forwarding to 1894, Benz produced the first standardized car, where it was a standardized process and development through the assembly line production. And in 1913, Ford uses the first moving assembly line. And the key in there is that it allowed the Ford Model T to be produced in barely over an hour and a half. So having this assembly line production process enabled us to produce more product faster and have a standardized result. Fast forward to modern technology and modern factories. For example, Coca-Cola now produces 4.5 million servings per day in a single factory, which is in and of itself is quite amazing. But you have to realize that this process is completely standardized, which is a which is a great powering enabler in that you know the exact inputs, you know the process that has to be happened to get the exact outputs that you want, whether it be Coca-Cola, a, a standardized gun, or from our car production. So how does that flow into software development? Well. First, we had hardware manufacturing, which was the Industrial Revolution. Then we came into the information area with technology and computers and information technology. So all we had to go on for those methodologies was manufacturing. So in comes waterfall methodology for software development, which almost perfectly mirrors traditional manufacturing. So to get there, the software development life cycle in and of itself has phases. You go through uh, initiation phases first, where you, do, you find a problem, you, you define a business need, and then you evaluate that need, you expand that need, you, you understand the need of that, and you plan for it, you make a schedule, you define the requirements, moving into the designing and the development, and then eventually implementation and putting it into full use and production environments. Now, Waterfall uses these exact same phases, but the key with Waterfall is that each of these phases go in turn. They, they follow a set pattern that is, that is key, and it, it directly maps back to traditional manufacturing in today's world with an assembly line for, for, uh, manufacturing process where the product has a specific start 
and it goes through these specific phases or stage gates to get the specific end result. And each of these phases start and stop at specific times. They have a specific length that's predefined, and they have a specific start and stop date that is, again, predefined. Now, there's many benefits to the waterfall methodologies. One, it's highly disciplined. Because of the strict progression through the phases, it's a highly disciplined methodology. And because of that high discipline, it is extremely simple to start. Um, it's and, it's and simple to implement because you know exactly the process that you have to follow. And because you know the exact process to follow, it is very easy to manage. It's very easy to know that if you are in phase one, you're going to phase two. And you know when phase two is going to start. You know who is doing phase two. Likewise, if you're in phase five, you know what you've just finished. And you know what you're doing right now. You know who's doing it. You know when you're doing it. And you know exactly what's coming next. And because of this strict exactness in the process... Waterfall is traditionally a very good methodology when you know exactly what it takes to get exactly what you want. Which, again, it came right out of mass production from a, from a manufacturing standpoint where we knew the exact inputs required to build a car. We knew the exact process we had to follow to get that car, and we knew what the end result of the car was going to be. It was very standardized. And with Coca-Cola, we know the formula. We know the recipe. There's very few variables, if any. We know the exact result we want, and we want that exact result every single time with little to no variance. And if that's where your environment, waterfall may be the perfect methodology for you. But there's also downfalls to the waterfall methodology. First, it's... It is classically linear. The, the same thing that gives it its power is one of the same thing. One of the things that is its biggest hinders is that there is no going back. Waterfall has a set specific step and process, and you do one step at a time, and you do not go backwards. So, in essence, you better hope that you've done everything in every single phase in the first time you had to do it. Each phase is traditionally owned by a separate team. Uh, the initiation phases are traditionally done by project managers, um, business analysts, working with the clients and the customers to understand the needs. And the developers oftentimes aren't involved until it's their turn in the process, which leads us to the next one. Typically, there's little collaboration between teams because each team is doing their own work. If my team lives in phase three, I'm going to be working on phase three for this project. When I finish this project and I pass it on to the next phase, I'm going to get another project into my phase and keep working on it. There's not a lot of cross collaboration between those teams. And because waterfall is linear and you don't go back, all of the planning for the project is completely upfront. It's all done first. And again, that's, that's fine, but you better hope that you know and are able to capture everything that you will ever need in that upfront planning process. And because we're planning everything up front, we're defining the requirements up front, those requirements are hard, they are strict. And there's a, there is change management to change requirements if needed, but it is near impossible to do that because we've planned everything up front we fix that scope of the work, and we deliver that as we've planned it. Now, speaking of fixing scope, this ties right into what's called the triple constraints of project management, or often called the iron triangle. An iron triangle consists of three points. The scope of the project, the time to do the project, and the cost of the project. These are the three points in the triple constraints. Now, in a traditional methodology, traditional waterfall world, scope is fixed. We plan everything up front. We define everything up front in the, in the initiation phases, and we fix it. We write all those requirements down in a 
and in, in documents. We deliver those documents. We get them approved by the stakeholders. And those are fixed. Those are defined, and they're not changing. Now, they can change if they need to, but it is extremely hard to change those requirements. What can change, what is flexible, is the time and the cost available to deliver that scope. And if the time ends up not being long enough, well, it's flexible, and we just add more time. And typically when you add more time, you add more cost, but you don't change the scope. So scope is fixed, time and cost is flexible. With this plan, with this environment, the project is very plan driven. You plan first and that plan drives all the rest of the effort. Not inherently a problem, but it is, it is the, the fact of the waterfall world. Now there's a group that does a survey every year, the Standish Group, and they do a, what's called a chaos survey. And they do this survey every year to, to kind of get a barometer check of the project management world. And one of the most recent surveys found these key indicators of the waterfall world is 86% of projects are either challenged or fail. Less than 30% of projects actually complete the way that they were planned. And 30% of projects are just canceled outright. And that's a lot of waste. That's a lot of wasted effort. That's a lot of cost that never has, has any associated value to it. So that was waterfall and traditional manufacturing. Now let's go backwards to manufacturing again and look at lean manufacturing which was developed by Toyota as an alternative to the, to, to the traditional world that everyone knew. So the Toyota production system was created by the founders of Toyota and is synonymous with another phrase called just-in-time production. And this is what they call a Kanban system. Kanban is a Japanese word that stands for visual card. And the Kanban system with Toyota was actually sourced through what they called the supermarket model. Where, and, we're, and we're all familiar with this. Every day, we need food. And so, we go to the supermarket when we need the food. And we go and we shop and we take things off the shelves. We put them into our cart. That's what our work in progress. And we purchase that food. We bring it home. And we bring home just enough. We bring home just enough food to last us X amount of days and when those days are over we go back and we get more we get more food that lasts us another X number of days so we're going to the supermarket and we're getting just enough food just in time just when we need it right and that is what Toyota has has turned into their Kanban system so applying that methodology to manufacturing imagine that you are the door assembly person. So you're the person who puts the car door on the car. And you can only work on so many doors at one time. That's just a fact. That's a constraint. So you have near you a stack of car doors. Well, that there's no use to have that stack up from the ceiling, up from the floor to the ceiling. There's no use. You can't use all that much. So you're going to have a stack of doors that just has just enough work for you to do and that makes it most sense for you to do it in the amount of time you have given. So as you're putting on doors on cars, you're decreasing your stack. Let's say your stack is 10 doors, and you put on five doors. Now, on top of the fifth door is a literal card. It's a Kanban card. And that card has details of the doors that you are assembling, that you are putting on a car. And that card essentially says, go get five more doors. So you take your card over to the door guy who supplies you with the doors and you say, hey, I need five more doors. You give him your card and he goes to get the door that you need and the number that you need them. So you get your five doors, you come back to your station, you fill up your, your inventory and you continue with your work. Meanwhile, the guy who 
gave you the doors, he has his own stack of inventory. And it has just been depleted by your five doors. And so he now has his own card that says, build five more doors. So he's going to start building five more doors. And he's going to use his own raw materials, so to speak, to assemble those doors. And when his inventory or his materials decrease to a certain level, he will have another Kanban card that says, go get more windows, go get more door handles. And then he will go to the person who's in charge of windows or door handles, and he'll get more of that item. And so it's a, it's a pull process in that you will pull just what you need right now. No one's pushing the work onto you. You will pull it and get it what you need when you need it, much like you're pulling product off of the shop, off of the supermarket shelf. The key objectives of this Kanban system or the Toyota production system is to is threefold. First, is to de design out overburden, and in Japanese that's muri. Second, design out inconsistency or mura. And third, to eliminate waste or muda. Now, waste is a is a big topic, and Toyota has actually defined and and uh, found seven types of waste that they continually strive to eliminate from their process. The first is the biggest amount of waste, and that is overproduction. There is no value in producing more product than we need. That's the biggest waste for them, for any production system. Second is waste of time on hand. Having extra stuff for longer than you need it is just useless. Third, waste of transportation, waste of processing itself, waste of stock at hand, waste of movement, waste of making defective products. Clearly, all seven of these components are very important in and of themselves. And anything that we can do in a production environment to limit or reduce any one of these points is going to exponentially impact our bottom line on the positive. If we reduce the amount of time it takes to transport products from point A to point B, we then reduce costs, we reduce time, and thus we can make our production system more lean. Same for the, the defective products. If we're producing on time every time, but it's all crap, then that's no value either. We've just wasted everything. So again, the keys of the Toyota production system are to reduce these seven types of waste. So Toyota created this production system, which, which has evolved and has been coined lean manufacturing. And the, along with it comes what we call the house of lean. And just like any house, the goal is to put a roof over your head, right? So within the house of lean, the goal is in the roof, right? And you reach that goal by building up to it, building those walls, just-in-time management, just-in-time inventory, Kanban systems, changing how we think, uh, changing how we work with the human process and the machine process in production systems. The idea of Kaizen in the lower right-hand side. Kaizen is a Japanese word for continuous improvement. So not only do we change our process to eliminate that waste, but we're continually looking for ways to reduce more waste and continually improve. And then all of that is built on a certain foundation. You've got to have accountability. You've got to have a sense of urgency. And you've got to have leadership backing the whole process every step of the way. Now, the House of Lean has, has more topics and, and content that we, that we could possibly look at in our short time frame here. But it is a great topic, and it is a key, it's a, it's a key principle in understanding lean manufacturing and lean methodologies as a whole. Now, just like traditional manufacturing tied directly into waterfall software development, Lean manufacturing ties directly into Agile software development. So what is Agile development? Well, Agile is not a single thing. Agile 
is really an umbrella that encompasses lots of different things. Uh, the tra more traditional words used for agile were iterative and incremental development. So, whereas Waterfall planned everything up front and you did everything in each step of the way, iterative or incremental means you just do small pieces and you do piece by piece rather than doing the whole process and taking the whole unit of work through every step you divide that work into smaller chunks and you take each one of those chunks through the whole process and then you go back and get more chunks of work and go back through the process because of this of this new way of doing things the requirements and the solutions evolve over time no longer are we defining all the requirements up front, and no longer are we designing everything up front. We're designing just enough for right now. We're defining just enough for right now. And over time, those ideas will evolve, and they'll get better. Similarly, our architecture is not defined up front. We don't need a full architecture up front. We don't need to define a database to house the entire world of information. All we need right now is just two tables. So we'll build the two tables to give us the function we need right now, and we'll look at building it and expanding it as we need it. Adaptive planning. So not only do we plan as we go, we plan just in time, but our process of planning can adapt over time. We might not need certain types of planning activities up front, that we might later on, and vice versa. And then value-driven. Um, we, we no longer con confine ourselves to the plan. We, we focus on the value, and we do what has the most value first. So again, agile in and of itself is just an umbrella. It's just a term that encompasses lots of different specific methodologies. Scrum being one of the more famous ones. Uh, right behind Scrum, you've got extreme programming, which is another agile methodology. And then as you can see, there's, there's several other agile methodologies. And they all have their similarities. They all have some differences. They all have their, they're all applicable in their own way for their own solutions. And it's, and it's very common for organizations to pick a process such as Scrum, use Scrum, and then pull a few different features from other methodologies, such as extreme programming. Very common process. So again, Agile is not a single thing. It's just a, it's a category of a new way of thinking of project management. Now, Agile itself um, is, is not necessarily new, but what happened, though, is in, in about 2001, February 11th of 2001, actually here in Utah at Snowbird Resort, 17 industry veterans from the development world came together to discuss their headaches. All of these men came from the various world of agile me methodologies. They each had their own backgrounds in agile. And they, they decided they needed to meet and to discuss the headaches that they had working on development projects with an agile mindset, but within a traditional project management world. And the result of these few days is what has now been called the Agile Manifesto. Now, the Agile Manifesto is very short, but very powerful. It reads, we are un covering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals over individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So let's go back and go through this Agile Manifesto. It's very powerful and kind of confusing at first. 
So we, we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That's not to say that processes are not important. We need process. Process is very valuable. Process is what got us into this into this world of the information technology. We had these processes that drove production. So processes are very valuable, but they have their place. And if we had to choose one or the other, we would always choose the individuals over the process. The individuals are in the process, they help drive the process, but the process is not more important. Similarly, we value working software over comprehensive documentation. You can make the most perfect, the most comprehensive, the most awesome user manual for a software suite. But if that software doesn't work or isn't even delivered yet, then no one cares about that user manual. That user manual has zero value without the working software. Now, documentation is very important. We need documentation. We need to know how to use our software. We need to know how to support the software. Documentation is very important. But, again, given the choice, we would choose to spend our time delivering working software that has more inherent value than working on documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Contracts are just pieces of paper. It's a piece of paper that defines a relationship. But rather than focusing on the definition of the relationship in that contract, let's focus on the relationship, the collaboration. Let's focus on that. And again, responding to change over following a plan. Now, we, we do this every day without realizing it. You may be driving on the road and you need to get from point A to point B. Unfortunately, Unbeknownst to you, there's construction, and that road has been closed. Is it worth your time? Is it more valuable to sit there and wait for the construction to end so that you can keep following your plan? Or would we rather take a detour, change a little bit, and get to our destination? What's more valuable, following the plan or getting the destination? So here, it's, it's, the, the choice is clear. We don't want to follow the plan if the plan is going to hinder us. Plans are good. Plans are important. Planning is probably more important than the plan, but a plan is very important. But if something happens or we have to change, it's more valuable to go ahead and change than to stick to that plan. So again, the items on the right are still valuable. They still have their place, but the items on the left are what help drive the value. And we're going to focus on the left first, but then look at the right later. So going back to the development life cycle, agile development in its general terms still has the same phases that a, that a traditional software development life cycle contains. Now on this, I have limited for space, but it has the exact same phases. So at the beginning, we're going to have some amount of pre-planning. We still have to define a business need. We still have to define cost ratios. We still have to define some kind of a plan. But the key here is we're not doing everything. We're only planning just enough. And then we enter what's called an iteration. Now an iteration is a repeatable unit of work, so to speak. It's a repeatable time frame. Within that time frame, we, we go through the phases. We do a little bit more designing, and then we go into the technical designing. We start building software. We test it, and we repeat that design, build, test cycle as needed. And as we go through that re repeated cycle, we're going to implement. We're going to release something to the end users. And once we've released, we move on to the next iteration, where we go through the exact same phases, but for different pieces of functionality. And we keep doing that. We keep iterating. We keep cycling through the phases rather than flowing through in a, in a linear term. We cycle through them. We just keep repeating those phases for different functionality, and we implement as we go. We plan as we go. 
Now, there's nine common reasons why Agile works. First one is the customer representative is in the driver's seat. In a traditional world, it was not uncommon to hear an analogy of throwing the grenade over the wall. The customer would have an idea or a need or a problem. They package it up in a grenade. You throw it over the wall to somebody else in the next phase. And you just wait for it to blow up. You you let them worry about it not blowing up. But even if it does blow up, you have a wall in between you and the other team so that you aren't damaged. The customer's not going to get hurt because we have a wall protection. Well, not anymore. Agile breaks down those walls. We get the customer involved every step of the way. We want a client involved somewhere because the client is the one who helps determine the value of what we've been delivering. We want their feedback. We want them to help drive the process. Quick reaction to the changing market. Because we're planning just enough for right now and we're doing just enough for right now, we have the freedom to change as the market changes. If in a waterfall world, you might spend the first few months of the year planning the entire rest of the year. Well, that requires you to know everything. And you follow that plan, and you're going to follow that plan as best you can. But the needs throughout the year will change. The market will change. And if you, if we already have a plan that's not for the full year, it's harder to change and react to those changing needs. Whereas Agile, you plan just enough, and as the market changes, you change. There's more visibility, and we won't get into it here, but there are a lot of metrics that are available within an Agile development that gives more visibility to the entire process. Agile, in a, in a lot of cases, was built from the ground up, as in from the developer up. And it's and that helps, is one of the keys to Agile methodologies, and the power of it is that it's a perfect environment for a developer, for the development of it. The developers are the ones that help deliver that value. And we want to make the environment can the environment valuable for them, where they can produce their best work. And part of that is point five, self-managed teams. We let the developers manage themselves. They're the ones who know best on how to do it. Let them figure out how to do it and manage their set themselves. We remove confusion and distraction. Uh, and there's there's various methodologies and ways to do that, which we won't get into here. But because of that increased visibility, um, we have no confusion. Because the customer is involved every step of the way, there should be no confusion. And there's, again, different ways to reduce distraction, letting the developers do the work they need to do when they need to do it. And we'll reduce distraction by filtering that information. No fortune tellers. We, again, we don't plan everything up front. We plan as we go. We don't have to know the future. Issues are less disruptive because we're, we're planning just enough. We're doing just enough right now. If something comes up and we've delivered something that was horrible or we have a massively changed market today, well, that's not a big deal because we didn't plan a whole lot, so we're not wasting much time. And continuous improvement. Again, with the Kaizen mindset, we want to... Find more ways to eliminate more waste. We want to continuously improve the process as we go. Now, Agile methodology is still a project management methodology, and so it still has the triple constraints. But the key here is we've flipped that triangle upside down. Scope used to be fixed because we were planning everything up front. Now, with the Agile mentality and Agile methodology, we plan as we go, and the scope can be flexible now. What we do fix is the cost and the time. And a way to explain this is understanding a, a common conversation starter. In the traditional world, the conversation would have been, I want you to develop this. Now you tell me how much it will cost and how long it will take. Within that mind mentality, there is no room for change. I've already told you what I want. You tell me how long it will take and how much it will cost me. With an agile mentality, we flip that statement around. Now we say, 
I have this much money and I have this much time. What can you build me within those constraints? What can you build me for $1 million in 12 months? Now, we're going to collaborate. We're going to define that scope together, but it's flexible. So now, projects that were traditionally almost always over budget and over time never are because we fix that time. We say we only have one year to develop it, and we don't go over. Now, we might make a new project for the next year, but this project will stay on time, stay on budget. What will change, if needed, is what we do within that time and in that budget. Sometimes, obviously, things change, so we just change the scope. We change what we deliver. And doing it this way, it ensures that we let value drive the process. We let the value drive the process. Rather than planning everything and saying, here's what I want, you go do it, that's the plan, we're going to say, I have this much money and this much time. I want to get my money back as fast as I can, so I'm going to do what's valuable most first. And that's the scope. And as the scope changes, we're going to change it so that we're doing what's valuable most first. So it's a very value-driven process. And just a quick comparison visually on Agile versus Waterfall. There's two key differences, I think, when I think of Agile and Waterfall. First is the value, and second is risk. Now, on the left-hand side, we see a, a visual representation of a waterfall methodology. Now, if we imagine the horizontal of time being a single year, let's say it's 12 months, at the start of the year, we have a certain amount of risk. And as time goes on, we're planning up front. We're doing all those pre-planning processes. We're designing. Hopefully, by the middle of the year, we have some development going. We're testing it. But because we're waterfall, we don't deliver any value until everything's done. So all of the value waits until the very end of the project. Because we're postponing all of that value, as you can see with that red line, our risk started at a certain point, but it continued to increase nearly exponentially. And that's because time is changing, needs are changing, but we're not addressing those needs in the waterfall methodology. We're not addressing the customer concerns. Maybe they, maybe what we're building for them right now is not what they actually want, but we're not going to find that out until we deliver everything, we finish everything. So the risk of delivering the wrong thing increases over time. Now, contrast that with Agile. Now, they both start with the same amount of risk. There is a certain amount of risk involved with any project, but the key is how Agile manages that risk through value-driven processes. So we're iterative, and so every iteration, we deliver a little bit of value. And over time, the value delivered continues to increase. So not only are we delivering more value sooner, in the end, we probably actually delivered more value in total. And because we're delivering items as we go, we're effectively reducing risk such that by the end or near the end of the project, we should have nearly no risk. Because so at that point, we shouldn't be working on the most valuable things anyways. That's been already delivered. Now we're working on the aesthetics or the extra would be nice to have items. So the risk is reduced because of that. But also, the customer's already seen the product. They've already been using the product forever. We have such a small risk that they're not going to like what we're delivering. So we manage risk by delivering sooner. Now, within that same survey, the chaos theory, the chaos surveys, 80% of the organizations surveyed are going agile. 60% of organizations who use Agile are using it on half of their projects. And an interesting, interesting fun fact is that as of 2012, the U.S. military is requiring that all projects from their contractors be managed through Agile methodologies. And again, that's to reduce their risk and to increase the value. Now, very briefly, we'll look at Scrum. 
Again, Scrum is a subset of Agile. It's it's part of the Agile development methodologies, but it has some diff has some specific details to it. Now, Scrum itself actually predates the Agile Manifesto, and you could even track Agile back to this white paper called the New New Product Development Game, written by uh, two Japanese gentlemen back in 1986. And in this white paper, they describe a new way of managing product development. And in that, we, they defined it as a flexible, holistic product development strategy where a development team works as a unit to reach a common goal, as opposed to a traditional sequential approach. So again, Waterfall is traditionally very sequential. We go through each step and we go through it in sequence. Well, they're proposing a new way of doing it where the whole group works together through the whole process. And so now we're looking at the holistic value. Just like holistic medicine looks at the mind and the body, the holistic product development looks at everything all together. No longer is this team focused on their little phase and their little silo. We all work together for the common good of the whole product. And just like a rugby team, where the word scrum comes from, the whole process is performed by a cross-functioning team. So if you compare scrum, or excuse me, if you compare rugby to traditional American football, American football has a certain number of players on the field, and each of those players has their own specific job to do. They each do their job. And as we progress up the field, only a few people actually move downfield or up the field, leaving behind the other ones because they're in their own roles. They have their own jobs to do. Now, contrast that with rugby, and the entire team works together, and they work up the field as an entire team, as a single unit, to where, in the white paper they quote, saying, the whole team tries to go the distance as a single unit passing the ball back and forth. Everyone has a chance to hold the ball if they need to. The key is there if they need to. It's a cross-functional team. Each player on the team has a duty, but they have the freedom and the ability and the skill set to fill in for anybody else on the team. Another key point of Scrum, again, is to deliver the highest value first. We prioritize our efforts, and we make sure that we're only working on what's of the highest value right now. And another key thing in Scrum is to fail fast. Now, that may sound kind of odd. You want to fail fast. But that's so important because, again, with Waterfall, we're going to postpone all the delivery to the very, very end. So the only time that we could ever fail, so to speak, within the delivery standpoint, is at the very end of the life cycle. Whereas with Agile, we're delivering as we go. We continuously deliver as we go throughout the whole life of the project and the product. So I want to fail fast. I want to deliver a screen or a mock-up or something to the user. Get something in the user's hands. Get their feedback now. And if their feedback says, this is crap, it's no good, let's move on, that's perfect because now I can go back and I can rework it, redesign it, and give them something else sooner. So I can do that within a matter of weeks rather than a matter of years. I can fail sooner, and but because I fail sooner means I can improve sooner as well. Now a very quick look at a Scrum iteration. Uh, I get Scrum again is, has iterations. We call them sprints. Uh, and Scrum has uh, has artifacts. The product backlog contains everything for the product. It is the single source of truth for the work to be done. The sprint backlog is a subset of the product backlog, and it contains everything the team is doing right now. We've planned just enough, and we have just enough in progress right now. And we do that over the course of two to four weeks, or a single sprint. Now, every day, we have an iteration, so to speak. Every day, the team meets, and they iterate, and they discuss what they've been doing, and they work every day th through, the, through that two- to four-week sprint. Now, the end goal 
of that iteration is to have something that could be shipped today. Now, the release cycle is not inherently related with the Scrum iterations. The release cycle could be different. We could release once a month. We could release once every six months, once a year even. But the key is the iterations continue every couple of weeks. So every two weeks, we've been doing all the phases of the life cycle through initiation down to implementation, if needed, for single units of functionality. So that by the end of the iteration, that unit of functionality is now ready and it could be shipped tomorrow. Whether it is or not is a different question, but it could be shipped. We package it up, we put it aside, and we move on to the next functionality. Now, I hope you were able to glean some knowledge through this, through this quick little session about agile methodologies. I hope you were able to understand now where they came from, understanding how software development relates to traditional manufacturing methodologies, how waterfall and agile differ, where waterfall is very sequential and you plan everything up front, and agile is iterative or cyclical, and you plan only what you need right now. And those are direct mirrors of the traditional manufacturing world where you have mass production and assembly line production has specific stage gates and a specific order to follow which ties into waterfall methodologies and then you have the lean manufacturing devised by the Toyota production system and we reduce our work in progress we only do just enough that we need for right now and we can respond to change as we need to and again agile is a is a grouping of methodologies scrum being the most common I hope to meet with you in our coming sessions to learn more about the specifics of the Scrum methodology and how to specifically implement and understand the different components of Scrum itself. And I hope that we can take this foundation of lean understanding, lean principles, to understand the driving factors and the importance of those various facets of Scrum that we will address in our future sessions. Again, thanks Appreciate it. Bye.